Okay, so everyone should see the title side of my presentation here. Um, so again, if you're, you're just entering the room, my name is Nicole Grenan. I'm an archaeologist with the University of West Florida, more specifically with the Florida Public Archaeology Network. And what we do is outreach and education related to local history and archaeology. Um, my office is located in Pensacola, Florida. It's also where I spent my time um, getting my master's degree here at the University of West Florida. Um, so the topic of my presentation today is something, um, again, near and dear to, to my heart and Pensacola's heart. Um, we're going to be talking about the fishermen of Pensacola's red snapper fishing industry, a topic that is infinitely interesting. So I'll give a brief introduction on the history of and what, what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm gonna look at the culture of fishermen here in Pensacola. We're gonna look at the vessels that they would have sailed on to do commercial red snapper fishing. We're going to look at the ecology really briefly of a red snapper in the Gulf. That's something that's kind of been on the radar of fishermen for many years now. And then we'll see how things have changed over time. And spoiler alert, they have changed quite a bit. I'm gonna go ahead and let someone else in the room here. All right, very good, very good. All right. So all of this starts, as you could probably guess, with one relatively small fish in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the red snapper. For those of you who are seafood aficionados, you've probably had red snapper uh, before if you go to restaurants or if you're, you yourself are a fisherman. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with this presentation was debunk, um, let's see, we got a quick question about, ah, okay, someone had to leave and go. This presentation will be available online and I will send the link out to you, Walter, so that you can watch it later. We, all, we put, always put these up on our YouTube channel afterwards so that other folks can watch it if they can't be with us at 3.30. So not a problem at all. Thank you. Um, so yes, starting with one small fish. And the goal of this presentation, or really this research, was to debunk some of the common myths surrounding commercial fishing in Pensacola history. Um, namely, um, that the history is all about you know, the, for lack of a better term, the older, typically white men who started the industry. A lot of these individuals were the entrepreneurs who founded the fish houses, but the actual men that were going out day to day to do the fishing were, were from varied backgrounds and from really all over the world. And we don't hear as much about them, but that's where archaeology can help. Um, one of the things that's commonly accepted in local lore is that fishermen typically sailed on schooners. And yes, this is absolutely true, but we know from historical records and oral histories that there were many, or at least several other kinds of vessels that were being employed to do fishing from Pensacola related to the industry. And then of course, this is kind of just a common <laughs> myth surrounding fishermen in general. I'm not saying it's not true, <laughs> but that fishermen like to drink. And for Pensacola history, what that kind of turned into was that fishermen were kind of these rowdy, uh, transient individuals who had really no ties to the community. But if we really drill into the historical and archeological records, we see that that's not necessarily true. So the approach I took was kind of a holistic one. Again, looking at the culture, looking at the vessels, and looking at the ecology of red snapper in the Gulf to see how those things interplayed with each other to kind of tell us more about the longer term history of commercial fishing in the area. And it turns out there's a very strong relationship between humans and their natural environment. I'm sure this doesn't really come as a surprise to anyone. Humans rely on our environment around us um, and the way we exploit that environment kind of drives um, industry locally. And that's certainly true here in Pensacola. For those of you who aren't local to Pensacola or have no idea where Pensacola is in Florida, we're actually located, here's a map of the Gulf of Mexico at large. We're located in the Florida Panhandle at the very western end. Um, we're about 15 miles from the Alabama border. Right here is Pensacola. Uh, Pensacola Bay was a major port during the early, late 
19th century, early 20th century, um, because it is a naturally deep water port. So very large vessels could easily get into Pensacola Bay, which made it a great place for import and export. Um, and kind of in the broader sense of this presentation too, fishing of course took place along the Florida coastline, but over time that evolved um, into trips across the Gulf of Mexico to fish off of what was called the Campeche Banks off of the Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. And that's about 600 miles away or so. Now red snapper fishing was a relatively abundant resource in the Northern Gulf early on. We have colonial records from the British in Pensacola in 1763 to 1780. Um, talking about how they could just throw a line in the water and catch red snapper because they bit so easily at, at the fishing lines. Um, and so, so it made sense to eventually start exploiting this. It wasn't until really the 1840s when first commercial fishermen started coming to the Gulf of Mexico from New England. Um, what they were doing was coming to Gulf of Mexico in the winter time when it was a lot harder to fish in New England or where you essentially couldn't fish in New England. Um, the, the winters are a little bit more mild in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so they could still make a profit in their off season. Um, and they brought with them their traditional fishing vessels, uh, their culture of fishing, and the methods that they use for fishing, which was primarily hand lines. Um, so not using a reel as we typ typically think about anglers using today. So the industry was really born in the years before the Civil War, but of course the Civil War interrupted that greatly. Um, it wasn't until after 1865 that we see major fish houses founded in the Pensacola area. Um, and several were founded at this time. We at least, um, at least three, and then as time goes on, more and more were added. Um, the really great thing about these years after the Civil War is there was a lot of technological uh, advancement going on. And one of the things that really aided uh, the fishing industry from Pensacola, um, well, there's two things. In 1880, Pensacola railroads were incorporated into the larger Louisville and Nashville railroad system, right? So you could easily transport something from Pensacola to the Midwest and the West or the East Coast of the United States a lot more quickly than you could have before. Even more important was the development in 1896 of on-site ice capabilities. So that is creating artificial ice. And that allows you to pack and ice your fish so that you can then transport them on the railroads. Before this, to ship fish or anything that would um, essentially very perishable food items, you had to cut ice and have it sent down from the Great Lakes so then you could then ship it out. And as you can imagine, that was very, very expensive. Um, and so eventually around this end of the, the 19th century, or I'm sorry, of the 20th century, no, 19th century, um, we start to see Pensacola becoming what was termed the Gloucester of the Gulf. Right. There was so much fishing going on here. It was attracting fishermen from all over the world. And this ability to access new markets created a greater demand for fresh fish throughout, like I said, the Midwest and the East Coast of the United States. And on top of that, Pensacola in general is just a growing city. Um, we obviously benefited from nearby ports like New Orleans and Mobile in Alabama. Um, but there was also the Pensacola Navy Yard that was bringing in more people from around the country. Um, timber and lumber were also uh, becoming very popular exports from the Pensacola area at large. So people were attracted to Pensacola for a variety of reasons. Um, and really, it was a unique Gulf of Mexico port in that it had such a cosmopolitan workforce, um, as we'll see in a second. So that's a little bit about the industry itself. Now we can kind of drill into a little bit more about the culture of fishing here in Pensacola. Um, much of it, again, was borrowed from New England because those were some of the first entrepreneurs coming down to do fishing, um, but it evolved over time. And we really, among maritime professions here in Pensacola at the end of the 19th century, it became a majority profession uh, by 1870, which is pretty soon after the end of the Civil War. And over time, we see changes in the ancestry of fishermen. And we can, do, um, and we can learn about the ancestry essentially from census records, federal census records. So early on, we see a lot of fishermen that um, have longer roots in local history. So um, you know, Pensacola was a Spanish colonial possession for many, many years. So we see um, 
many fishermen of Iberian ancestry. Um, but later on, that changes as people, more and more people start coming in. And so we can really break down fishing culture into kind of two different sectors, the offshore experiences and then their onshore experiences. Now offshore, um, life was uh, obviously confined to your vessel, right? You were on your vessel and you were with the men you were with for however many days your trip was. Early on in the industry, uh, the days of fishing were relatively short, right? Your, your trips were maybe two or three nights long. As fish started becoming more scarce, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit, um, more trips were becoming longer, right? As the need to go to those Campeche banks off of Mexico really started to kick in. So those trips became a month long. And so as you can probably, you know, figure out, the, the lifestyle on board vessels changes a lot from early on in the industry to later. Um, but in general, the crews were very diverse. Um, we see people coming uh, from all over the United States, as it was at that time, but also a lot of fishermen from Western and Southern Europe. Um, so we see folks from um, the United Kingdom, from, uh, again, Spain, Portugal, uh, but also Greece, Italy, all kind of those Mediterranean countries, um, because they do fishing there as well. We also see fishermen from Scandinavia, quite, quite a bit of um, individuals from Denmark, Norway, Sweden, um, and Finland. What's interesting is that most of the crews that were hired by the fish houses located in Pensacola um, were generally uh, what we would call today white individuals, right? Um, and whether or not that would have been categorized the same way back during this period, I'm not sure. In the census that I looked at to get this information, they were indeed categorized as white individuals. Um, but what's interesting is that we also see to kind of like a, a secondary degree, we see black and mulatto working crews as well contributing to the fishing industry. These crews generally worked with each other and they worked on smaller vessels called chingamarings or chings, but they still sold their catch to the local fish houses. So they were taking part in the industry just in a different way. And it seems to me that that probably was systematic, right? It was something that probably the fish houses encouraged was, you know, you had your white crews on the larger vessels, you had these black crews kind of taking advantage of, of local near shore fishing, but to a smaller extent. Um, so kind of an interesting look at, at the, the culture of offshore fishing. Now onshore, it was actually a little more varied than that. What's, and Again, we looked at the census records to be able to get the addresses for where these fishermen were living. We would, from the census, we would know their uh, ancestry, the profession that they engaged in, and then where their address was. And then whether or not they lived with their families, right? Were they married? Did they have children? Were they living in a boarding house um, that was sponsored by the fish companies? Um, and yes, to all of those things. Um, Pensacola was very much a port town at the, the turn of the 20th century. So we have lots of bars along South Palafox Street, which is kind of the main drag in downtown Pensacola, if you're not familiar. And on West Zaragoza Street, um, this was our red light district. So we certainly have a number of brothels operating in that area. So it's a very working class community downtown. Um, most of the fishermen we see in the census did not really have wives or families. Some did. Those were usually first mates or captains or, again, the owners of the businesses. Um, but although most of our fishermen were single, a lot of them did live with their parents or with their siblings or with relatives. So that, that idea of fishermen as these kind of transient folks drinking and, and you know, doing whatever they're doing on West Zaragoza Street um, is not necessarily the whole picture, right? A lot of them did have roots and ties to the community. And we can also tell from historical records and newspapers that these fishermen took part in wage strikes um, to, to essentially better their lot, right, as fishermen. So they did have a stake in their lives and they did want to make their lives better. So the idea that they were just kind of, you know, individuals that were always drunk and going out to sea and didn't really care about their lives, doesn't really stand up when you look at the historical records. One of the things that I did as part of this research, and I'll go through this just quickly, was I actually plotted the addresses of fishermen uh, and where they lived um, when they appeared in the federal census. So you see, a, um, this is essentially a map of downtown Pensacola. It's called the Sanborn Fire Insurance Map, and this was produced by the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company. 
And it was a way um, to do insurance claims in case of fires, but it also gives us a great idea of where buildings were at certain periods of time when the maps were produced. And in this particular map, which I think is from around 1910 or so, um, I essentially plotted all of the residences of these fishermen um, based and the different colors correlate to the years that they lived in those places. Um, so the yellow and pink are part of the map, but the blue and the green and the red, those are fishermen living where they live. And what's interesting is that you can kind of see there was a boarding house at the end of Palafox Wharf, um, which is where the E.E. E. Saunders Fish Company was. Um, so there's a boarding house here. There was another boarding house at the end of the Balin Street Wharf where the uh, Warren Fish Company was located. And then you see a lot of fishermen living in this very much working class neighborhood on the west side of downtown Pensacola, incorporating what we call the Tan Yards neighborhood. Um, so you can see, you know, single folks probably who had no local connections were generally in these boarding houses, but most of our individuals were living in single family homes with relatives or individuals that they knew on this kind of west side of town. Some archaeology has been done in these neighborhoods. Um, not enough to, to explicitly tie a location to a particular fisherman or his family. Most of what we see in the neighborhood is things that you would expect to see as an archeologist, right? It's the, the material of everyday life. So we see, you know, ceramics, pharmaceutical bottles, hygienic items, right? The kinds of things that you would expect to see in a home. Um, but very much a working class neighborhood is reflected in these artifacts. They're not especially, um, uh, expensive or luxe items, right? They're kind of everyday utilitarian things. Now these fishermen conducted their business on fishing vessels. Um, and like I mentioned before, we have two kind of primary types of fishing vessels. This is an image of the smaller one um, called the Chingamaring or a Ching. And the thought is that these were essentially adapted uh, pilot boats that would have been used in Pensacola Bay for ships coming into Pensacola Pass. Um, and so these were either rented or owned, generally, generally by black or mulatto crews, um, and they were definitely smaller vessels. They had these kind of three interesting masts, um, a long sharp bow with a round bilge, um, a vertical heart-shaped square stern, and they were pretty light and very symmetrical. Um, they were generally less than 20 tons, so they were open boats. Um, you're not going to spend nights offshore in these kinds of things. So the individuals fishing out of these vessels were staying close to home. The other type of fishing vessel oop, was the schooner. Right, and this is what we typically think about when we think about fishing, especially during this time period. And the Pensacola fishing schooners generally were either from New England or built locally uh, and adapted from the New England model. They were two-masted schooners. Um, they were generally between 25 to 100 tons and would have crews of eight to 12 individuals. Um, they, as far as length goes, about 50 to 100 feet in length and over time, they get bigger and they get longer to accommodate those bigger trips offshore. Um, archaeologically, we have several shipwrecks that have been tentatively identified as uh, Pensacola uh, fishing schooners. Not any chingamarings, unfortunately, have made it into the archaeological record that we know about. Um, just real quickly, one of these wrecks is the Hamilton Shipwreck, which is located just off of Warrington, Pensacola area, which is where that little star is. Um, this shipwreck is the wreck of a two-masted schooner. It was investigated by University of West Florida archaeologists. It's approximately 65 feet in length and has a hold that's about, at least, I guess, about six feet deep. Um, we produced a site plan on this particular vessel. Um, and it looks, oops, let me go back here, looks something like that. It's in a relatively shallow part of this area off of Warrington, so it gets covered and uncovered uh, by sand pretty frequently. And in our last attempts to identify it, we actually could not find it again. It was so buried. Some artifacts that came off of this vessel that indicate it was probably a working vessel uh, and probably a fishing vessel included very utilitarian ceramics, um, we call it uh, whiteware, that just means kind of white plates. Um, 
Albany slip and Bristol glazed earthenware, very fancy term for things like ginger beer bottles, um, silver plated utensils, condiment bottles, um, Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire sauce was one of my favorite ones uh, collected from Hamilton's Reg. Um, personal goods certainly would have been needed for longer trips offshore. Um, razor handles, toothbrush handles, cosmetic bottles. Um, actually, one was for uh, Pompeian face cream, which if you're a fisherman who is shaving frequently, you might need a face cream. And then, of course, there's architectural artifacts as well, and these would have been part of the ship. So things like iron fasteners or copper tacks, but nothing that explicitly said fishing, although we think this vessel um, probably was out of use when it was erect or abandoned where it was. So maybe nothing uh, substantial would have been left on that could have still been used. A second shipwreck that we've got related to fishing is what we've nicknamed the Snapper Shipwreck. And this is actually up in the Blackwater River, um, closer toward Milton. We think it was probably brought up into the river as a way to either take it away from the open port of Pensacola during uh, the encroachment of a hurricane, or possibly it just got old and they towed it upriver and let it die upriver instead of creating a hazard to navigation in the port. Um, the Snapper shipwreck, based on UWF investigations, showed that it was a Fredonia model schooner that was about 100 feet in length with a 21-foot beam or width. Um, and this would have been amongst one of the larger vessels uh, that was in Pensacola fishing, uh, which is quite interesting. We know based on the archaeology, here it is located up here, based on the archaeology that it was indeed built in New England. Um, and that's because there is a special feature called a mass step um, <clears throat> that was built into New England fishing schooners to prevent um, whoever was at the, the, um, the tiller or the wheel from washing away when a wave came over the board. Um, and this is just an image of what that vessel would have looked like potentially. Um, that is a Fredonia model schooner two masted. Uh, cultural material on this wreck, uh, we did have some artifacts, but again, really minimal, which makes us think that it was at the end of its life when it was towed upriver. Um, some different kinds of fasteners, um, again, architectural things, copper tacks, copper sheathing that would have been on the outside of the vessel to prevent um, marine worms from eating the wood. Um, there's a snap case bottle base. Um, this would have had maybe gin or something like that in it. Um, there's this really interesting uh, and fascinating deck prism. So this would have been embedded in the deck of the main deck of the vessel to allow light to filter into the lower deck. Oh, all right. And then a third vessel, this one more tentatively identified as a fishing vessel. This was one called um, we, we think it's the Priscilla based on historical records. This was investigated not by the University of West Florida, but by the Florida uh, State University Program in Underwater Archaeology um, a bit longer ago. This was a smaller vessel that was 60, about 69 feet in length, had about a 20 foot beam and a nine foot hold. Um, why is it doing all these interesting zoom outs on me? Uh, hmm. Anyways, it was another Fredonia model schooner, and it is slowly being eaten away by the barrier island that it's on, which is the pictures that I'm trying to show you here. Um, essentially, it's on this barrier island called Dog Island, and over time, the island is sort of shifted. So where the shipwreck was once essentially on the beach, now it's moving further and further offshore. <clears throat> well, it's a shame that this isn't going to work for me but you aren't missing too much. Cultural material on this shipwreck, there was nothing left. This has been on the beach for a very long time. And when it was wrecked, it was essentially abandoned. We think it was probably wrecked in a hurricane. So if one of your questions at this point is, how do I know so much about which vessels were in Pensacola doing fishing? Um, the answer is this really interesting historical document called the List of Merchant Vessels of the United States. And this is essentially a census for working vessels in the United States. And it tells us um, the name of the vessel, its tonnage, its length, its beam, its depth, where it was built, where it was operating from its home port, and in what industry it was engaged. And so based on all of this, I kind of collected the data for the years surrounding the turn of the 20th century. Um, and that provided me with the ability to analyze um, essentially how these ships changed over time. And without getting into it too much, 
what we eventually do see is that over time, their tonnages are increasing, the depth of the holds are increasing, the length increases on these vessels. They're basically, they're getting bigger. And we also see that these vessels are going further, right? They're more ocean going vessels. That's why they're getting bigger. And that reflects the change of fishing grounds from closer to Pe Pensacola and Florida all the way to Mexico. And we do see, you know, fluctuations in locally built vessels. Um, local builders were trying to make these vessels, but for the most part, it was cheaper for the fish houses to just buy old ships that had can no really longer fish in the really cold, tumultuous waters of off of New England, um, but they they do just fine in the Gulf of Mexico. So we do see a lot of that. And so here's just a chart that I used to plot all of that. So essentially, getting bigger and holding more over time which is really no surprise. And that ties in very neatly with the ecology of the Gulf of Mexico red snapper fishery, right? Early on, as I've mentioned, the fishing grounds were very close to Florida. And this is very early on. So when we're talking the first New England fishermen to come down, they were sticking right to along the Northern coast within the continental shelf, which is where these fish generally live. Um, and this was around 1840. And over time, as the industry kind of establishes itself, especially after the end of the Civil War, we see movement to grounds that are um, off of Louisiana and Texas, and also grounds off of Tampa area. But really, even by 1897, so not very long in terms of time, uh, people and fishermen are starting to travel all the way to Mexico to get more fish. And, right, and this is caused, I think, by two things, an increase in demand for the fish, but also, I think individuals were starting to notice, and we can see this in the historical records, that the, the fish are starting to get overfished closer to shore. There are less and less of them and they're getting smaller over time. And you can kind of get an idea of what the ramifications of that would be for an industry. Right? So based on, again, on historical data that I was able to find during this research, I was able to plot catch sizes in red snapper over time. And this is just for Escambia County, which is the county in which Pensacola, Florida is. Um, and we can see, you know, catch sizes really peaking around 1900, and then they kind of fall off over time. Um, and there are other historical events happening that cause these issues. It's not just the amount of fish that are in the Gulf of Mexico. There are massive hurricanes that essentially afflict Pensacola every 10 years, starting around 1906. They call these the sixes. Um, and these hurricanes do massive damage to the Pensacola waterfront. World War I, um, the Great Depression, World War II, all of these things kind of detract from the ability to easily go fishing from Pensacola into the 20th century. But in general, we do see catch sizes starting to decline from the peak of the industry. Now, what can we draw from all of this based on what we know about the culture of fishing and the vessels themselves and then the ecology of Gulf uh, Red Snapper? Um, well, the industry started dying not long after it began, which is kind of sad in a way. There were fluctuations due essentially to overfishing and then hurricanes in World War I, early in the 1910s. By the 1920s and 1930s, we start seeing new technologies brought into the industry like engines um, into the vessels. Um, and um, automatic reels and things like that, but it doesn't do a lot in the face of not only overfishing, but major world events like the Great Depression and World War II, um, in which some of the vessels were hijacked to become essentially um, minesweepers off of the Gulf of Mexico, which is kind of interesting. Um, by the 1960s, a lot of these vessels were very old and broken, and updating them was going to be very expensive. And so other things happening around this time, including the closure of the Campeche banks to US fishermen due to the institution of new exclusive economic zones really sounded the death knell for the industry, right? So we do have overfishing, we do have old vessels, which would be very expensive. And then we have the ability to not fish from the place we've been fishing at for essentially the last 50 years. And so, you know, 
we don't really see commercial red snapper fishing operating from Pensacola really past the mid 1970s. And then in the 1980s, there's really no ability for it to be resurrected um, because of new conservation act. Um, the economic focus in Pensacola shifted as a result and recreational fishing kind of became more of the focus, right? We have um, more people coming to Florida at the time to vacation and to do fun things. And so it was an obvious transition. And obviously conservation measures for recreational and commercial fishing are very different. And so it was, it was an easy way to kind of adapt what was already going on into a new form. Um, and this is one of my favorite photos. Um, this is actually a couple in the 1950s fishing off of the shipwreck of the USS Massachusetts, which is just outside of Pensacola Pass. This was a, a Spanish American war battleship that was sunk during target practice from um, uh, the local Pensacola uh, Navy Yard area. And um, it was a popular spot for folks to bring their boats out to and to kayak to, and they would use it as a fishing spot. It's still a wonderful dive spot today if you are a diver. It's part of Florida's uh, Museums in the Sea program. So what we know about Pensacola fishing at the turn of the 20th century, short-lived as it may have been, was that it was highly diverse, right? We have vessels and methods that essentially derive from a Northern tradition, a Northern United States tradition, um, and that fishermen weren't the transient population that a lot of our local histories have, have kind of made them out to be. They had roots in the community. They wanted to better their position. Um, and they lived in really diverse neighborhoods, which wasn't as reflected in their, their kind of division on vessels offshore. Um, so we had black families, mulatto families, and as categorized by the census, and white families all living in the same neighborhood, even though they weren't necessarily on the same boats offshore. Um, and as I think is obvious, there's a very distinct relationship between the environment, the marine environment, and commercial fishing in Pensacola. Um, the fishermen relied on the environment, and the environment in turn was affected by their fishing, and it's kind of a positive feedback loop over time. And by positive, I don't mean the end result, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to do with my presentation was look at whether or not any of these red snapper fishing vessels were still around um, that had fished from Pensacola. And unfortunately, by the time we get to the 1980s, um, there are only three left. Um, by the time we get to 2014, when I was doing this research, there was only one left. Um, one, we presume, uh, his, its name was Buccaneer, is out in the middle of Pensacola Bay. Another one was taken down to Tarpon Springs, Florida, and turned into a sponge diving uh, fun recreation boat. But that one, I think, was also eventually kind of towed away and let to rot. Um, but this vessel, the Letty G. Howard, um, which was known as Mystic Sea um, when it was here in Pensacola, um, is still around. And this is a picture of it. It is currently owned by the South Street Seaport Museum. It's a National Register of Historic Places property, um, so it was listed on the National Register. Um, here are its kind of drawings, its schematics when it was drawn up for the National Register. Um, a great deal of work was done to, um, to renovate it and to turn it into a working museum ship. And that's essentially what it does today. Its home port, again, is the South Street Seaport Museum, but it does make its rounds around the United States. And most recently, this was two years ago, it came back to Pensacola with a group of um, students from the New Orleans area who were learning essentially what it takes to work on a sailing vessel. And the crew came in town and found um, some of the research I had done online and invited me to come out on the ship and talk to the students about red snapper fishing. Um, so there's a picture of me there with students on board the Letty G. Howard. This was the first time it had been back in Pensacola Bay since it's left almost 100 years ago. So that was a pretty meaningful uh, thing for me to be a part of on that day. Um, and I was really grateful that the crew invited me to come out. Well, that is about it for my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Let me go ahead and stop my screen share. I know there's a lot going on here. Um, one of the things that I had wanted to do with, with this research was kind of tie together multiple aspects of Pensacola history um, into a meaningful way. So looking not only at archeological records, but also historical records um, and, and ecology to some degree as well, although that's not really my wheelhouse necessarily. 
Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. If not, that is fine too. Um, you're also welcome to unmute your mic if that's easier for you. All right. Well, I'm going to take that as potentially there are no questions. Um, I will put my email into the chat box here. If anyone thinks of something in the middle of the night that they're really curious about, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me for Zoom into Archaeology today. Um, we're going to be hosting another Zoom into Archaeology talk on March 25th. And this one will be by my colleague, Mike Toman about the archaeology of Gulf Islands National Seashore. And there's so much fantastic archaeology in Gulf Islands. I can't wait to hear him talk about it. So thank you all for being with me today. And uh, have a good rest of your week and a lovely weekend. Thank you.